before we start Half Blood Prince, hopefully you watch the concluding lecture on this. Since I don't know what happened Wednesday morning, I got up here, I was fine Wednesday morning, and then I just and had to leave. Um, is there anything you want to talk about at the end of Order of the Phoenix before we? Because there's only one thing that I think is is actually. Oh, here, take that back. There's a lot I can talk about, obviously. Um, but this class is going to be excited. After Harry has his debriefing with Dumbledore, after Sirius's death, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the night before they get ready to leave, he runs up to, doesn't run, but he stops nearly headless Nick. What? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Life's sad, you know, and then you die. Um, so he stops nearly headless Nick, and Nick's like, you know, can't wait till after the feast? Harry's no. Which, of course it can, because Sirius is always going to be dead from that point on. So, Nick says, page 860. Um, I, I was expecting this. What? You to come seek me. Why? It's, it's just, you're dead. But you're still here. Okay. What happened to Sirius? Don't tell me he died. He fell through yeah. the veil. He fell through the veil. What kind of spell was he hit with? Was it Avada Kedavra? Yeah. It wasn't because it wasn't a green jet. Avada Kedavra is always green. It was a red jet. Okay? Hits him. He gets a shocked look on his face like, I can't believe my cousin did this. And he falls and he goes through that veil, right? So the veil's hanging right here. Sirius is over here. The veil's hanging right here. Sirius falls through it. What does Harry then do? He runs around to the other side. Because he's thinking there's a curtain there. He just nearly went through the curtain. He goes around the other side. No serious. Okay? You know, after a little bit. So he doesn't, doesn't really understand this. Go back to the beginning of when they arrive at the Ministry of Magic. And they go into this room at the beginning. What do Harry and Luna hear? Voices whispering. And what's the veil doing? It's moving, but there's no AC in this room. Why? There's no AC in the magical world. It's one of our contraptions. And the thing's moving. And notice in that scene, Harry keeps going closer and closer and closer to the veil. What's Hermione doing? She's saying, stop it. And she's backing away. Why? Harry's attracted to it. Why? Think Mirror Vera said. Is it just curiosity? I think Vernon's partly right. I think it is curiosity. What, according to the Mirror of Air said, what is his heart's greatest desire? Yeah. To be with his parents. Well, there's only one way to do that, for them to die, okay? And Hermione's backing away. Why? What is death to the rational mind? It's not the great next great adventure. Why? Because we don't have any books that tell us what death is all about. Right? You, you can't read a whole bunch of accounts of what it's like. Yeah, there's people who say, I saw a great light. I heard a beautiful voice. I blah, 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 blah. And then there's also the ones that say, I saw fire and burning and people, you know, rotting. And so, you know, which one are you going to pick? So he asked Nick, you're dead. Very good. Astute observation, Harry. You're still here. That's right. You, you, you died, but I'm talking. Uh -huh. I walk and talk. So people can come back as ghosts. What's Harry thinking? I'll see Sirius again. Yeah, but mom and dad didn't come back as ghosts. Hmm. No, he will have gone on, he says. What do you mean, he will have gone on? Wizards, he says, can leave an imprint of themselves. A pale imitation. Very few wizards choose that path. Why? Anyway, he'll come back. He will not come back. He will have gone on. What do you mean gone on? Just page 861. Wait, what do you mean? What happens when you die? Anyway, 
How old is Jerry? He's 15, right? He's soon to be 16. He's never, ever thought at all. Maybe I'm just weird this way. I'll be the first one to admit it. About death? He's never known anybody who died? Well, he doesn't have any friends outside of Hogwarts, right? He's never seen a dead animal? Come on. Unless he's living in a fishbowl, he's had to experience something of death. What happens when you die? Ah, oh, but that's not what he means. He means where you go. So what does the question presuppose? An afterlife. There's something. It's not just, you disappear and become one with the cosmos, you know. Why doesn't everyone come back? Why isn't this place full of ghosts? I, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You're dead. Of course you know. I was afraid of death, he says. I chose to remain behind. I sometimes wonder whether I ought to have. Well, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> neither am I, really. I'm not there, wherever there is, but he's not really here either, right? Because Nick wants to stick around at the feast. For what purpose? Can he eat? No. That's right. That's right. So he says, I believe they study this matter in a room in the Department of Mysteries. Don't talk to me about that. So he says, sorry, Harry, couldn't be more help. Harry leaves. Look at the description. Top of 862. Okay, Because this is going to happen to him exactly, almost the same thing later on. Harry felt almost as though he had lost his godfather all over again, in losing hope that he might be able to see or speak to him once more. He walked slowly and miserably back up through the empty castle, wondering whether he would ever feel cheerful again. So having this experience with Nick is kind of like being surrounded by Dementors, right? Sucking all the joy out of him. What was the, the little inkling of joy he had before talking to Nick? He wasn't completely gone. He could come back as a ghost. He can still talk to Sirius that way. Now, gone. Totally gone. Wiped out forever. Okay. And he runs into, what's her nickname? Looney Lovegood. Hello, how come you're not at the feast? Oh, I've lost most of my possessions. Okay, notice how she says that. I've lost most of my possessions. People take them and hide them, you know. So she hasn't lost them. People stole them. Telling us what? People are jerks. Okay? The night before, she's got to get packed. An odd feeling arose in Harry. An emotion quite different from the anger and grief that had filled him since Sirius' death. It was a few moments before he realized he was feeling sorry for Luna. Okay? Notice, full of grief over Sirius, he hears Luna and about Luna's problem, and what happens to that sense of grief? It lessens. Why? He's not alone. He's not alone? Why else? He's like, he's like Ned. Yeah, he's like naturally a protector. He's naturally a protector. We heard Lucius Malfoy call him Patronus Potter. Okay, what else? Because this goes back to the first book, and we're going to see it all the way through the seventh book. And I think it's something that Rowling is trying to impart to his readers. Whenever Harry focuses on himself, totally on himself, how does he feel? Miserable. Because usually when he does that, it's when something bad has happened. Okay? Um... McNair cutting Buckbeak's head off. Right. Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay. Hagrid's got to deal with the problems with the Ministry, right? Care, you know, disposal of magical creatures and stuff. Well, Harry finds out that Hagrid knew about Sirius Black and everything, and Harry just he kind of goes berserk, and he wants to march down to Hagrid's hut and talk to him about why didn't you tell me about Sirius Black, you know, betraying my father, blah 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 blah. 
right? He gets down there, and, and what's Hagrid doing? Anybody remember? Dying. Why? Because he uh, lost his appeal. Because he got the letter saying, you've lost the appeal, and we're going to come kill Buckbeak. And what does Harry realize? Or what? Take that back. He doesn't realize this. This is what happens. He's full of hatred and anger at that moment, and he sees Hagrid, and that hatred and anger just washes away. Why? Because of his love for Hagrid. Right? And then book four, the same thing's going to happen. Book five, it happens here. So, he feels pity for her. How can people hide your stuff? Oh, I don't know. They call me loony. They, Harry, repeatedly calls her loony. Okay? The pity, feeling of pity intensifies. Well, that's no reason to take your things. You want help finding them? No. They'll come back. They always do in the end. Notice the language she uses. They'll come back. Like Ryan's bottle there, or someone takes it. And she says, it'll come back. On its own, like it'll float back to a blue. You know. What? How do they come back? Magic, probably. Is it magic? Or people could have put the stuff in the Also, the food was happening multiple times. Exactly. But what is she really getting at there? Nobody wants my bottle. Nobody wants his bottle. It'll be okay. It what? It always turns out okay in the end for her for Luna. So she asks, she turns the tables on him. Because he asks, why aren't you at the feast? Why aren't you at the feast? Didn't feel like it. She goes, no, I suppose you wouldn't with me. I mean, Godfather just got to go. Have you, uh, who, who have you seen who died? Mom, quite extraordinary witch. She did like to experiment and <clears throat> killed herself. I was nine. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was rather horrible. Still feel sad about it sometimes. I've still got dad, and it's not as though I'll never see mom again. Harry's like, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> what was that? You know. Uh, isn't it? Oh, come on. You heard them behind the veil? You mean in that room with the archway? They were just lurking out of sight. That's all. You heard them. Now, are we told specifically anywhere here to the end of book seven what Luna hears? No, we're not. Are we told specifically anywhere what Harry hears? No, we're not. What we do hear is that there's like whispering. But Luna, I think, kind of implies she doesn't just hear, you know, like sometimes when I come in the room, and there's all kinds of noise. I don't walk in and pfft, it goes silent, you know. She's, I think, hears more than just. She hears voices, voices. They look at each other. Luna was smiling slightly. Harry doesn't know what to think because Luna is loony. And he asks her, you sure you don't want me, want me to help you look for your stuff? Oh, no. I think I'll just go down and have some pudding. Wait for it all to turn up. It always does in the end. She walked away from him, and as he watched her go, he found that the terrible weight in his stomach seemed to have lessened slightly. Why? What is Luna, without using the word, one of two words, just given him? Hope. What else? Something to look forward to, I guess. Without using the word, faith in what? Things will turn out in the end. Okay? Now, go to the beginning of this one. And let me preface this. One of the books, you know, uh, this was one of the summers I taught in London, London uh, summer of 2005. Told the story before. The day we were leaving was the day of the first London bombings. So we were all called saying, don't do anything. We might not be going, but we might be going. And we got there the next morning and, you know, constant vigilance was on the trains, in the tube, in the buses. It's like Mad-Eye Moody's there, you know, warning everybody. 
And then three weeks later, two weeks later, another bombing attempt. Okay. Well, how does this one open? With another minister. Okay, the other minister. Who's the other minister, by the way? Prime Minister Biden. Is it? Oh, is it? Is it the Prime Minister? Is it Rufus Scrimger? Is it Fudge? It's never made clear which minister the other minister refers to. Okay, so why this chapter? What's happening? Or what has happened? Why? Because the kind of things Harry's expecting to happen at the beginning of book five, now it's happening. Okay? You have the Brockdale Bridge, which in the film is not some bridge outside London. It's the Millennium Bridge in London. Okay? Film came out while we were there. We saw it in IMAX to show you how much I hate the films. I was asleep within five minutes. In an IMAX. Okay? I saw the Death Eaters destroy the bridge. I... What else do you have? You have the quote-unquote hurricanes in the West Country, which turn out not to be hurricanes, right? They're giants. And then there are a couple of murders. Whose murders? Emmeline Vance? Susan Bones. We know those names because they both show up in the previous book. They're both what? They're on the living room, aren't they? Um, Susan was one of them that tried. She Harry. was one of the interrogators of Harry. Okay. Her family were members of um, Order of the Phoenix, the old Order of the Phoenix. Emily Vance was, in Book Five, a member of the Order of the Phoenix. Okay. And they're both dead. Dead how? I don't mean unliving. No marks. No marks. No forced entry. Doors locked. How did it happen? Okay. So we see the other minister and we get the description. Fudge and the prime minister are talking. Prime minister says, had a bad one too, have you? This is, I don't know, around page three, two or three or four. Fudge, yeah. I've been having the same week you have, Prime Minister. And he talks about the murders. Wait, your people were involved in those things, were they? Okay. What blew Harry's mind at the beginning of um, book five? No. Not quite the beginning. After Dudley Demented. He's in the kitchen with the Dursleys. And what sudden realization hits him? The wizarding world? And the magical world? Uh, the, and the muggle world? Same world. The distinction, the wall that he had created between them. It doesn't really exist. And notice what we're being told here. What happens in one, what? what? Happens in the other. Go back to the beginning. Not quite, but almost the beginning of book one. Harry gets on the train. He's with Ron. He buys a bunch of food from the trolley cart. He gets a chocolate frog, box of package of chocolate frog cards. One of those is Albus D Dumbledore. What does it say about Albus Dumbledore? Known especially for 12 uses of dragon blood. 12 uses of dragon blood. Friendship with Nicholas Flamel. Friendship with Nicholas Flamel, who discovered the. And defeated the, the dark wizard Grindelwald in what year? 1945. Whoa. Gee, what happened in the real world in 1945? Who was defeated? Nazis. Grindelwald had a Nazi mentality, which we are going to see, not in this book, but in the next book. Okay. 
right? So you have that parallel go on between the real world and the other world. Muggle world, and I'm using muggle intentionally. I'm, I'm thinking muggle in the sense of Dursley muggle, right? Because what are we told about the Dursleys? Very beginning of book one. They don't hold to what? Anything strange. Anything strange, anything out of the ordinary, any nonsense. In other words, they are what are called logical positivists in philosophy. What does that mean? Only what can be objectively verified is what's real. That's the only thing that's real. So if it's a concept that can't be proven, it's not real. It's not If it can't be objectively verified, it's not real. Right? Well, none of this, according to them, can be objectively verified. Why? Can the Dursleys find the leaky cauldron? Why? Because they don't have the eyes that properly see it. This is the physical material world. This is the world, you know, most of us inhabit. I'll say most of us. I'll say me. Maybe you guys are all, you know, wizards or something. The other, what? It includes this, right? Because Hogwarts isn't a ooh, floaty castle in the you know sky kind of thing. It's physical, but it also has this immaterial aspect to it because I don't know about you but I can't suddenly stand here and think I'd rather be home apparate home I can't hop on a broom and fly I'd love to be able to that'd be totally cool no matter the broom no matter how hard I think about it it's not going to happen right? so you get this blending again yes Caitlin Immaterial, spiritual, okay? Spiritual just meaning non-physical, but having some kind of essence to it. So I don't know what other word applies other than spiritual, okay? So we see in the other minister chapter, fudge gets canned, okay? The prime minister has protection, magical protection, okay? And... We are kind of introduced to Rufus Scrimgeour. Let me get rid of this. Yeah, I can get rid of all this. Um, this book, by the way, came out, published in 731, uh, 2005. Why, why the 31st of July? <coughs> Terry's birthday. It's Terry's birthday and it's J.K. Rowling's birthday. Book 7 came out also on J July 31st, but 2007. Chapter 2, Spinner's End, okay? Yeah, you probably don't have time for this, but... So, just real briefly, what's important about this chapter? What happens there? He makes the unbreakable vow. Snape promises the unbreakable vow with Narcissa Malfoy. For what purpose? To protect Draco. Okay. That's ostensibly why this is important. Why else is it important? Okay. It, it solidifies their trust in Snape. Mm -hmm. Does Bellatrix trust Snape? No. Bellatrix doesn't really trust Snape. Even after, because she keeps she keeps him safe from even after the last issue. And we get all this stuff about, you know. The Dark Lord, trust me, are you saying you don't trust the Dark? I mean, Snape turns all of her words on her, okay? What's the title mean? Could be. It's a place name, right? It's the name of the street he lives on. It goes like this. They walk down the street. And what kind of buildings are, are we told on the street? Snape's is a dumpy little house at the end of the street. And what's over here? Dead factories. Okay? Factories that nobody works in anymore. So, think of a place that if you've been to one, went to school outside Chattanooga, we go down into Chattanooga all the time, and it was back when the foundry was totally closed. And, you know, 
Half the windows are broken out and everything. Smokestacks never did anything. He lives on the street where that is. So he doesn't live in Bell Mead or Brentwood or Franklin, you know, pick your quitty quitty quit. This is this is project kind of, right? Uh, should I go? Nah, I can't mention that yet. So, Spinner's Inn. Caitlin, what did you say? That could be re that could refer to Snape as the spinner of lies? Yeah, like a web of lies. Or web of lies. Why? What lies? He's in a deep, so he's like for both sides and he can get to both sides. Okay. Who spins things? Spiders spin. Spiders spin, as Caitlin said, webs. Who else spins things? Maybe you know a weaver? Like that. Weavers do? Silkskin? Have any of you ever heard of the Norns or in Greek, the Fates? How many are there? Three. Three? I have it written down in this book. I probably don't. Because I won't remember the third one. Yeah, there's three. In Greek, you've got Lachesis, Atropo. And I can remember, never remember the third one. And I've got it written down somewhere, but it's not written down in this book. One of them, one of the fates, spins the thread of your life. The other, yes, it is in the Hercules movie. The other one measures the thread of your life. So, so you might have this much spun. But one measures, doesn't cut, measures. And then atropo, from which we get atrophy, atropo comes in and cuts it when you're done. Okay? Who else might spinners in, or what else might spinners in refer to? Well, let me, hold on, before anybody says it. How many of you have not read this book before in my class? Three, okay. We'll hold off on that. We'll come back to that later, because I don't want to give something away yet. Because <clears throat> it's pretty, pretty big. Um... Will and won't. Importance of that chapter is what? Creature, right? What what does Harry have to do with creature? Creature belongs to him. Harry has to give him a command to make sure that the the inheritance, so to speak, sticks. And it does. There's something else though. Before Harry does that with Creature, when Dumbledore arrives, notice Harry hasn't told the Dursleys. Dumbledore knocks on the door. They open the door. He's standing there for a long period of time, and they don't invite him in, so he invites himself in. And he pulls up a chair, kind of, or draws up a chair if you want, a couch. And we're told, page 49, Vernon starts to say, I don't mean to be rude, and... Dumbledore finishes, yet sadly accidental rudeness occurs alarmingly often. And he speaks with them, and we're told, pages, I can't tell you pages 56 and 57, it is somewhere around 51 to 52, 53, Dumbledore tells them, Harry will come of age. Next year. And they're like, no, he won't. He won't turn 18 until later. And Harry's like, yeah, but wizards be turn of age when they're 17. Okay? And so he tells them, next page, possibly the same page, you know Voldemort's back, okay? You know Voldemort's tried to kill Harry a bunch of times. And then he says, you did not do as I asked, as I asked when. When he dropped Harry off and left the letter, that's what the howler referred to. Possibly. 
possible. When it said, Petunia, remember my last. Okay? You did not do as I asked. You have never treated Harry as a son. He had known nothing but neglect and often cruelty at your hands. The best that can be said is that he has at least escaped the appalling damage you have inflicted upon the unfortunate boy sitting between you. What's the appalling damage inflicted on Dudley? Un yeah, but now he's a rock rip stud. I mean, Southeast boxing champion. He's a spoiled brat. How, how is that? On, how is that appalling damage? Yeah, no, I have to take the word no. Okay. Now, he's used to having everything in hand. And I wonder if he's actually going to have to go out and work for it. Instead of being like, hey, I want this. And do you think Rowling is directing that at her 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old reader? This is more parenting advice by Rowling. She's telling her, don't spoil your children. Why? Look, Harry wasn't spoiled, but he's had a pretty crappy life, right? But because he wasn't spoiled, what can he do, for example, with an Imperius curse? He can throw it off because he has strength of character. Why is it Ron and Hermione want Harry to teach them defense against the dark arts? Because he knows it so well up here, intellectually, book level. Instinctual. Because he can act on the fly. Okay. Which they have difficulty. But in the book five, what do we see? Even Neville. Who, even, even Neville. And by the way, here's something, and I'll, I'll stop with this since it's 11.06. This is something that was just entirely fortuitous in terms of the casting. Neville was perfect at 11-year-old Neville. Plump, kind of dumpy looking. Nobody would ever expect anything to happen with him. And by the time he turns 16, he is Dudley when he's Southeast boxing champion. He stands, sheesh, the guy's got to be like a foot taller than um, the guy who plays Harry, okay? And he's just ripped. Well, what happens to Neville? The prophecy could be about Neville, right? It could have been about Neville. And without Neville, and without saying anything else, in the book seven wouldn't happen. Right? Okay, we'll stop there. We'll do, we'll get through a lot more. It, I hadn't planned on saying anything about um, book five, but I did. <laughs> Sorry. What day is today? Friday. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I'm, Dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's a week and a half ago, and it just went straight to me. It's just... <laughs> Yeah, 10 minutes early. What am I thinking? So, he tells him <laughs> the, uh, the magic that was placed on Harry will end next year. And, and notice, he then says, or what we're told is, the Dursleys don't say anything. Dudley's frowning. Why? He's trying to think about how he's mistreated. How have I been mistreated? Vernon... Looks as though he has something stuck in his throat. Like he's he always say stuff like that, though, whenever he's talking to the lady? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe he does. Because he can't. It's not like he can just mouth off to the lady. No, no, no. It, he's described in a similar manner every time. Pretty much. Petunia, however, <laughs> is flushed. Why? She's been called out. She's ashamed. He got me. I didn't treat him like my son. Okay? So, chapter four, Slughorn, which I'm going to skip. The only reason, you know, that's important is because we see Slughorn get hired. And what are we told about him? For what purpose? Bragging put him on a shelf. Bragging rights, put him on a shelf. What other reason? How are every one of you, unless you already have that position within your chosen profession, 
what are the odds, or, or more than likely, how is it you're going to get a job in that pro chosen profession? Who you know. Networking. That's what Slughorn is the master of. Okay? Um, excess of phlegm. Uh, Fleur and Bill are going to get married. And Harry gets his owls. Are any of the owls a surprise? His result, potions, because he gets and exceeds expectations. Okay. Um, and dreadful or troll, sorry, poor or dreadful, poor in divination, dreadful in history and magic. Thinking of all the classes Harry takes, which are the two that don't really matter? Those two. Those two. Okay. Draco's detour. Um, what happens to Harry on the train? Actually, it's not in that chapter. Uh, Draco's detour, let's just skip, because I, I know it's important, but we'll come back to it later. Slug Club. Not much to say, other than he's already started collecting his trophies. But what happens at the end of the chapter, on the train? So Harry's gone to spy. Right? I mean, that's what he's doing. He's got to spy on Malfoy, gets into his compartment, gets up on the luggage rack. Hogwarts Express must be a lot bigger than any of the trains I've been on in London because those luggage racks aren't big enough for somebody to um, to get on. And Malfoy sees him. They arrive at Hogsmeade, and Malfoy stuns Harry and then does what? Does he kick him in the nose? It's a very emphatic image. He stumps on his face. So he's down there. Harry's frozen like this. He can't do anything. And he comes up. What does that have to show? What do you have to do, be, in order to do something like that? A Malfoy, okay. Merciless? You have to be filled with what for the person you're doing that to? Hatred. Rage. Just want to kill the SOB. Why? Why so much rage on Malfoy's part? Where's his father? In Azkaban. Okay. Who, who rescues Harry? Honks. Harry gets to Hogwarts. And um, let's see here. Tom's kind of walks him up to the gates, and Snape kind of uh, welcomes him in. And in the chapter, Snape victorious. Why is Snape victorious? He's finally teaching defense against the dark arts. Okay, chapter nine, Half Blood Prince. So. He thought Slughorn was going to be teaching it. Slughorn's teaching what? Potions. Potions. Okay. Bottom of 165, top, sorry. 171, 72, 73, probably somewhere around um, 174 or so. I think that's right. Um, I've got to run through the names. Neville is having uh, revision advice, that is his classwork advice, with McGonagall. And he really wants to take her transfiguration. So they're going over it, and she says you did outstanding in, in herbology, exceeds expectations in defense against the dark arts, exceeds expectations. But he only got an acceptable in transfiguration. Yeah, but she's the teacher of it. Couldn't she kind of, you know, let him in through the back door? She could, but this is McGonagall. She's not going to give anybody any slack. So she asks, why do you want to continue with transfiguration? The green leather is. 
it's high time your grandmother learned to be proud of the grandson she's got, rather than the one she thinks she ought to have. Does she finish you with that? Does she just say, why? Why does she add on that last comment? Particularly after what happened at the ministry. What's she telling him? Be proud of you what you've done. Way to go, Neville. You did what? You took on Voldemort, not personally, but you took on his, you know, hirelings. Neville turns very pink. Why? Ashamed? He's embarrassed. He's blushing. I'm sorry, Long Brown. I can't let you take my grandmother thinks charms is take charms. And I shall drop Augusta a line. She calls her by her first name, indicating what? Two things, I think. They're close. They're close. They know each other. How long has McGonagall been a teacher? 50 years now. How old is Neville's grandmother? Do you think she's McGonagall's age? She's not. McGonagall would probably be like old enough to be Augusta's mother. Right? So she's kind of Putting Neville's grandmother in her place. One, she calls her Augusta. She doesn't refer to her as your grandmother. But then she says what? I'll drop her a line reminding her just because she failed her charms owl. That's kind of like, not as the teacher of charms, but as deputy headmistress to former student. And what's he just told Neville about his grandmother. I, theoretically, could not do this with one of you. If one of you were to come to me and say, you know, Dr. Sherman, my mother, my father, wants me to take X, Y, or Z. I couldn't say, Travis, I, I can't let you do that. Because let's say Travis's mother's name is, I don't know, Jenny. I, I, just because Jenny wants you to do that, I can't. Because I remember when Jenny took it, she only got a C. That would be breaking. Uh, yeah. FERPA laws. Federal educational rights and protection something. Yeah, probably not. Okay. Now we're two minutes over, so you should have shut me up earlier. Okay, so we'll 